Amy, welcome to Mastering You. Fantastic to have you today. How are we doing? All right. I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me on here, Matt. Yeah, no, we just had a little catch up before we started. I'm really excited about this one. Um, it's a topic we actually haven't had on, you know, pain and um, helping people get out of pain is something we surprisingly over 100 episodes or 105 or six, I think we're on now. We, we haven't gone too deep into sort of pain relief. At LPT, I would say one in three of our members when they first come to us that they've got some element of of pain or discomfort or they're struggling with some sort of dysfunction movement wise in their body so it's yeah it's something that i'm really passionate about and i'm sure many of our listeners will be really keen to hear some different strategies and, and maybe words of wisdom from an expert like yourself one of the things that i always like to find out first is where the passion comes from from the expert which is you like what, what where did this passion for understanding pain pain relief where did that all come from amy where did it start? I think, yeah, it started very young. I grew up in a very stressful household. And I remember watching adults and thinking, why is everyone so stressed? <laughs> why, why is that such a big deal? And then the other thing I heard, I have back pain. They, everyone I knew equated age with back pain or some kind of body pain. And so as I grew up and then, you know, got older, I started looking at, okay, how can I help people? I really found that it satisfied a need inside me to help others. And I could do it in a different way. And I was, I started in the, my doctor in physical therapy. And then I switched out of that when I realized that I could start to change my internal nervous system and wiring. At the time I was training to qualify for the Boston marathon. And I was running on the treadmill eight miles at a time, several times a week. And I started playing with how I held my body position and that impacted how I breathed. And all of a sudden I could run and I didn't have the tightness. I didn't have the aches or pains and I'd get off an eight mile treadmill run. And I felt like I just got on. I didn't have to stretch. I didn't have to foam roll. I didn't have to scrape. I didn't have to do all those things that I was teaching people as a traditional physical therapist. Was there anything and, that would that kind of triggered that initial de desire or, or idea to just focus on your body position? Yes, I started taking some coursework through for my continuing ed requirements. I started doing some coursework through the Postural Restoration Institute, which studies the asymmetries in your body, like your right hip flexors attach higher on your spine, and they they were looking at why how that helps people or hurts people and how that leads to compensations and how that also impacts breathing because you have asymmetries in your diaphragm. And so when I started doing that coursework, it's like, okay, they're thinking about things differently. How can I take what they're telling me? And does that impact me while I'm running? And how can I use that to do something differently with my body while I was running? And it, it took a while to realize what I was actually impacting was that fight or flight nervous system. Okay. When I changed my body position in a certain way, I could calm down the fight or flight nervous system. So I wasn't in high alert while I was running. Mm -hmm. It just took me down a notch. And when I changed my body position enough, I could change my breathing pattern to access my diaphragm better, which also further calmed me down. And so all of a sudden I could run marathons so much faster without doing any other additional work. And I blew through the qualifying times for Boston. I mean, wow. just blew through them. I was like, wow, this is incredible. Mm. But then of course, you know, when you stumble on something new, it's like, okay, well, what just happened? Can I replicate on myself? Can I start teaching other people this? And can I put it into a process? And that's what the next several years were about. A lot of anguish, a lot of tears, but when you feel the relief that I felt after running eight miles, and then I applied it to a marathon and I ran a marathon pain-free, okay, that is something that's like, okay, I got to teach other people how to do this. That's where the passion came from is I can't just keep my mouth shut anymore. So, so the listeners are like, okay, let's do, we want to find out what these body <laughs> positions are. What are we doing wrong? What are we doing wrong? Yeah. So one of the biggest things it's going to go against, it's going to rub raw for most of your listeners is we have to get out of that Superman posture. 
throwing that chest out, shoulders back, sucking up your gut. We have to get rid of that because that takes our body to one extreme. Our body is supposed to exist in this kind of imaginary neutral where you can bend, curl up in a ball, go in a fetal position. And then if you want to go to the other extreme into Superman, chest out, shoulders back, suck up your gut. But you shouldn't exist in Superman pose. Yeah. You should exist in neutral. You should move in neutral. There are a few times when you should exist in Superman. That's when you're in fight, flight, freeze, or fawning mode. When you're in high alert and you need to act very quickly or very powerfully for a very, very short period of time. When you sprint, like if you're doing a hundred meter dash, obviously you wanna be in fight or flight mode. You wanna pull every resource in your body to sprint as fast as possible. So yes, chest out, shoulders back, run on your toes. That's a great, that's a great um, sort of acknowledgement of what it, what you're, is, you're saying of the sprint, isn't it? Because it, it's the ultimate kind of um, visual of, you know, because it, it is literally a flight. <laughs> you're, you know, you're, you're, you're fleeing. Obviously you're not running away from something, but you are going as fast as you can. And you see those, those sprinters those 100 meter sprinters like literally puffing their yeah. puffing their chest out um mm -hmm. yeah sorry yeah. carry on Did that makes sense no, no, that's, that's totally great and i'm glad you brought that together because the other thing is when you see people do like deadlifts or some of the really heavy weight lifters they are also in fight or flight mode to generate in su almost superhuman strength superman strength mm. but for the most part for most weightlifting for like when you're doing like trying to build a base or for running many anything long distance or any cycling swimming anything where you're doing something for a period of time your body's not designed to be in fight or flight mode so we need to get out of our head that we're supposed to be in this sucked up gut posture chest out shoulders all of those positions because it tells your body you're in fight or flight mode so when you're in fight or flight mode, your body's not designed to be mobile and fluid and flexible and relaxed and calm and digesting and sleeping. We want our body to spend most of its waking hours in relaxation mode, but still functional. Mm. And then occasionally you spike up. If you're running that marathon, you get to 26.2, 26 miles and you have two tenths left. By all means, throw your chest out, shoulders back, sprint and go those last two tenths a mile. But the first 26 miles, uh-uh. Calm yourself down, stay steady, learn how to keep your ribs down in neutral so your legs and arms work to move you the distance. And here's why. When you throw your chest out and pull your shoulders back, and lift up your ribs, you are creating a hinge off of your low back. Mm. Your rib cage that's supposed to be in this nice cylinder is now hinging off of the low back. The low back muscles kick in. Your fight or flight nervous system lies along your spine. So the more your back muscles are kicking in to create this flat spine, the more you're compressing on the fight or flight nervous system, stimulating it to react, that puts you in high stress, high anxiety, <laughs> fight or flight mode where your muscles tense up throughout your body and put you in that ready position to flee from danger. And what, what you just danger. described was the culmination of about eight to 10 years of, of mistakes that I made myself that put me uh, uh, not last Christmas, the Christmas before in, in sort of a state of not being able to walk for about six weeks. Um, and that, that was all, it all stemmed from a, a poorly, poorly lifted heavy deadlift when I was younger, you know, that, that put a disc out and, you know, many years of trips to the osteopath to kind of try and resurrect that without, you know, getting to the bottom of, of what was really going on. And what you, what you bring back, bring it back to the neutral spine that you mentioned, because that's one of the first things that we, we the PTs learn at sort of PT school is, is understanding what mm -hmm. neutral spine kind of looks like. But obviously you've got people that have the, their natural um, bigger curvatures, whether it be lordosis or, or different mm -hmm. you know, elements where they're, they're going to be more susceptible to that than others, right? 
There is, obviously there's differences in the natural curvature of the spine. A lot of that though, developed because a person was trained to stand and hold themselves a certain way and they mirrored their parents or guardians or whoever they grew up mm. with. Yeah. So much of that is based on what they mirror, but there's also a cultural aspect. So I work with people around the world and I've, I've come across many cultures where, especially for women, you are taught to throw your chest out, <clears throat> suck up your gut, and you shove your front body, your upper body forward, which increases that lordotic curvature. And I have to be careful because if I start taking that away, that's a very cultural disruption, especially for the mindset and the body and the mind. So it's a matter of we want to work to reduce some of those curvatures but you have to do it in a safe way where you learn how to bring that breastbone in, not by crunching, but melting in so the curvature reduces. So the curvature may not go back into more of a gentle S curve. It may still be at the more extremes, but you start to reduce it and the person starts to feel the relief, but you have to do it slowly. If you do it in a way that's too fast, your nervous system is gonna rebel, pain will increase. Interesting, interesting stuff. What do you find sports has an effect as well? Like the you know certain positions yeah. in on certain sports pushes people's posture into, you know, um, that that kind of that posture you're talking about. Absolutely. So sports, sports are great. Obviously, there. I mean, there's too many numerous benefits to even talk about. But the one thing about sports is we need to look at the sport. Let's say like we, we've talked about running, but let's say we're doing basketball. Okay. So with basketball, you're jumping, you're shooting. There's a lot of fight or flight movements in basketball, but then there's times where you can, like you're running, dribbling across the court, you're kind of waiting to set up the court. That could be a down regulation time where you're just dribbling, you're walking. So that's a time where you wanna bring your chest down, your ribs down. So you calm yourself down to get ready for that layup. Mm. So you can look at sports as this like roller coaster of fight or flight nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system. So you can sprint, but then bring yourself back down as much as possible to conserve energy to go into the next one. The problem happens when people stay at that high alert state for several hours, their body starts to tense up because you're pushing it to the limits. So a lot of sports training will be, okay, let's push it to the limits for a long period of time. But that's when people become very susceptible to injuries because they don't know how to bring themselves back down. Because the more you keep yourself on high alert, the muscles contract voluntarily and in something called sympathetic tone where the muscles contract without your awareness to guard you. So if you stay in that state for two hours, four hours, whatever your sport is, afterwards, you try stretching, you try coming down, but if you only apply external factors to bring you down, you haven't changed your internal wiring, so you still feel ramped up. Mm. And that's important because a lot of times when you do a heavy workout or athletic event, you can't sleep because your body is still set in fight or flight mode because the methods you've used to calm you down have been external and your body doesn't really change its internal wiring to bring you back down so that you can to totally recover yeah. and relax and let go. And so it, that's the magic of the body. You can play with it. This, and this is the, the thing like, I, you know, hopefully like to get over within this podcast and is uh, I think a lot of people are unaware just how connected mind and body are and you, you know, um, it, it, when it comes to pain, particularly things like back pain, shoulder pain, people think that the location of the pain is, is in that area. And mm -hmm. what we understand is just, just how much your hormones, your nervous system, your, your, what you're doing as a whole is actually, can you talk to a, a little bit, I like to kind of get into pain and, and yeah. give people a bit of, um, What's the ABC kind of on pain? How do we, what's the beginner's guide to really understanding what the hell is going on when I have pain? Is, you know, can, can pain be located or is that generally one of the biggest myths? 
So there are different types of pain out there. So you have like orthopedic pain where maybe in the skeletal structure, your joints, your muscles, your nerves, you have pain there. Then you have like something like pain related to a tumor or some kind of in your organs. So the pain I want to talk about that kind of comes and goes, that's not just a constant related to a disease process like cancer. Let's talk about like orthopedic muscle, skeletal, something that just you woke up one day, all of a sudden you have pain when you sit. So I'd like to tell people pain is a signal from your body to your brain that something is out of position. Okay. What typically happens, and we're talking about orthopedic or skeletal, is your body moved into a position, now tissues are butting up against each other. That sends a signal to your brain, guess what? Things are touching, they shouldn't be. So stop doing whatever you're doing. Obviously, we don't always know what that, what that what's going on. But if you think of it this way, you're, something is touching that shouldn't be. That bony structure is held that way because of your muscles. Your muscles are told to behave that way by your nervous system. So if we can change the nervous system to tell the muscles to behave differently, the bones are then held differently, the pain can either increase or decrease based on what you told it to do. Mm. Okay. So if we look at it that way, it's a very basic view. But let's say, let's say all of a sudden you have front of the knee pain. I know based on the front, front of the knee pain, we're going in the generic sense of typical situation. Because you feel pain in the front of the knee, there are tissues compressing there. So that tells me more likely than not, your pelvis is tipped forward. You can't sense and feel your hamstrings. Your pelvis is tipped forward likely because your low back is overarched, your rib cage is elevated in the front. So you have the pain in the knee, but that's because there's something physically off position there, but is the problem in your knee? Not necessarily. If we look at the position of your breastbone and get you to drop your chest down and in so your front lower ribs stop having that drop off and come down and in so that your low back relaxes, your pelvis can rotate backwards and you can sense your hamstring, guess what, your pain goes away. So was the pain in the knee, technically, yes, it was, but that we have to look at the whole body because the pain likely developed because you were off position because of something higher up. Yeah, yeah. Does you so, so um, when, when and when we're talking about pain, what's causing the pain? Is it is it mainly inflammation? Is it what what what's is it movement? What's what's actually causing yeah. the pain? So for the most part, it's some kind of mechanical or inflammatory process so something is rubbing up against each other which sets which sets off an inflammatory process and stimulates a nerve that goes to your spinal cord that then tells your brain guess what you have pain so there's a whole gateway process that's why a lot of people will use you know you hit your elbow on something you rub it that rubbing of your hand on your skin sets off a sensory process to block the pain signal to your brain. So then you stop feeling as much pain. There are different pain pathways in the body, but there is typically a mechanical aspect. So when I, I'll get people, I'll get doctors send me people that say, oh, they're malingering. They're, they're, it's just all in their head. And I say, no, I've never met someone where their pain is just in their head. It is not just psychological because what happens is when you have a stressor, even if it's just a mental or emotional one, that still tells your muscles to contract, it's called sympathetic tone, that can pull bones out of position and cause actual pain because tissues are butting up against each other and there's an inflammatory process going on there. So even also we work with people who are just stress and anxiety and they have body pain and it's literally the stress contributes to a muscle contraction that they're unaware of that pulls something out of position and causes pain. So it's mechanical and inflammatory. And did you see that quite often that there's a big link between people that are suffering with anxiety, high stress, um, maybe sort of mental health 
issues and, and pain? Is there, is there a correlation Absolutely. there? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, and it's a strong one because we're not disconnected from our mind. Our body and our mind want coherence. We, we crave that. Our body, mind, spirit, everything craves coherence. When one part is off, it's going to impact the other, even if we're not aware of it. Our body physiologically changes when we have stressors and we're always going to have stressors. So it's a matter of, can we recognize that, become aware of it and then ward it off, or at least have some activities we can do that bring our body out of it. So our muscles stop overly contracting and contributing to pain. Mm. The, 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 the issue, I suppose, around pain is that distinguishing between, you know, let's talk about go back, going back to back pain. You know, do I have a bulging disc? Do I have a sciatica or do, what, is, it, is it my thoughts? Or, you know, for, for people that haven't done the level of kind of um, looking into this and the education expertise that you have, you know, for, for those people, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of like, where do I start, isn't it? And I was just saying to you before we started the podcast, I, I've certainly noticed just since we've come back to some form of normality in the world after the pandemic with more people working from home and, and just working at, at desks and, and almost through the pandemic as a result of the pandemic being forced to work, let's call it from home on their kitchen table in bad working conditions. Um, we've certainly noticed a big sort of lift in, in back pain issues. Um, how would that link to what we were talking about earlier with the posture? Is that all kind of intertwined? It really is. And when we changed our habits going into the pandemic, there is more sedentary lifestyle. So you're not used to using muscles throughout our whole trunk and our legs and our arms. So the back took the brunt of it. Our sitting position may not have been great. Some people converted to sitting on the edge of the chair, which overused their back. Some people converted to slouching in their chair with their butt really far forward, which still overuses the back or adds pressure to it. And we also, when we're highly stressed, and most of us were during this pandemic, our rib cage lifts up even more to put us in that protection mode because we don't know what's going on. And as soon as that rib cage lifts up, our mechanics in relation to our back are going to change. Our breathing pattern is going to change. We're going to change to a fight or flight breathing pattern and use less of our diaphragm when we breathe because we then start lifting up our ribs to breathe instead of using our diaphragm to draw air into us to breathe. So all of that impacts our back and can lead to back problems especially if your back muscles learn to contract and they don't know how to relax when you go to move, twist, or turn, the vertebrae can't slide as the way that they are designed to. And that can lead to the slip disc, the herniation, the pinched nerve, all of those things. Mm, interesting. Okay. So this is a nice segue now into the power of breath. You know, how, how can breath work something as simple and free completely free you can save some money on therapies <laughs> just breathing correctly mm -hmm. how can how can that how could that possibly have any effect on all of this <laughs> i mean yeah yeah well it's great breathing itself you can use it in a lot of different ways you can use it to ramp you up you can use it to calm you down you can use it to heal you can use it in different ways and it all starts with the diaphragm so our diaphragm, if you imagine like a barn silo, there's a dome on top and then there's walls. In order for us to calm ourselves down, the dome needs to drop down and flatten on top of those walls. That stimulates a nerve called the vagus nerve that helps calm us down. So that process of the dome going up and down helps us calm down. That's why we hear so much about breath work nowadays. Now, the thing is a lot of breath work out there look at breathing based on timing and rhythm. They'll say like box breathing, hold your breath for four seconds, you know, or breathe in for four seconds, hold for four seconds, blow out for four seconds and repeat. Then you have some breathing that focuses on breathing in and out of your nose. 
Then you have some breathing like Wim Hof that is a hyperventilative breathing because he's trying to ramp you up even higher into fight or flight mode so you can withstand the cold or withstand an acute infection like E. coli. But that's for short periods of time. You're not supposed to exist that way. So you can also work on, this is what I teach, is how to use breathing to rewire your nervous system to calm you down. And so in order to do that, we want to maximize the diaphragm. To do that, the walls of the diaphragm need to be strong and supported so the dome drops down so it can stimulate that nerve. The way that those walls are supported is by your ribs in front being down, your side abs helping hold them down. So the more you suck up your gut and lift up the front of your ribs to stick out your chest, the more you get away from diaphragmatic breathing. Mm-hmm. You go into Superman posture that takes away support for your diaphragm. So in result, then you have to lift up your ribs to breathe. And when you lift up your ribs to breathe, you're arching your back more, you're stimulating the fight or flight nervous system, you're going into fight or flight breathing, which is why that works for when you're sprinting. You see them stick out their chest so that their breathing pattern can go into fight or flight mode to stimulate their body to go. Sorry, into who was that? What was that example? So like a runner, a sprinter. Right. Yeah. Sprinter. Sorry. Yeah. When, yeah. When a sprinter is at, you know, is sprinting, they stick their chest out, they suck up their gut. So now they're not using their diaphragm mm. as a predominant force. They're using the ribs to lift up because they want to stay into fight or flight mode to get to the finish line fast. And so with they breathing, want- you can, you can kind of, I, I, I used to do a bit of a test on this actually. Um mm-hmm to find out whether you're more of a, a chest breather or um, more of a diaphragmatic breather. And uh, this, when I used to run retreats, when we were allowed to go out the country, <laughs> um, <laughs> we used to go to Portugal and um, just do a little test. And, and it would it'd be quite interesting to do it. We'd do a 60 second, maybe a two minute test, just to count how many breaths someone would take, you know, within that time and no surprise, the, uh, the people that were kind of anxious, stressed, you know, were the chest breathers and they were, they were breathing quite fast that they would get something like 20 plus breaths in just in one minute. And then the very calm people that sort of breathe correctly and, you know, you're talking like eight to 10 breaths yeah. in that whole minute. And so uh, are there any other, is, there, is, that, is that a good test? Is, is there any other things that you can do to... Did you find some people are more chest breathers than more sort of diaphragmatic breathers? Are there any correlations there with the stress anxiety element that I just mentioned? Yeah. So people who are of higher anxiety, they're more likely to have the rib cage up. They're going to be breathing shallow when the rib cage goes up and that signals you're going to bring shallow that tells your brain stem that you're in fight or flight mode. So besides the position, you're also indicating your brainstem, you're in fight or flight mode. So it's going to continue breathing that way. Now, there are people who are calmer, but, and so they breathe slower, but there are people, most, this happens for most people, the situation you're in will alter your breathing pattern. Okay. So let's say I'm working with you, Matt, and then we work through this, you're now breathing where you're accessing your diaphragm. As you blow out, your belly spilling out. It's not sucking in. You're in calm mode. Now, let's say all of a sudden you had a fight with someone. You're arguing. Next time I see you and you're kind of heated, your breathing pattern will have changed without you realizing it. Mm. You're going to be in fight or flight breathing pattern. Your rib cage is going to be elevated. You will have changed. So most people don't recognize that very quickly unless someone points that out. And so then we say, okay, Matt, let's, let's work on your rib cage position. Let's blow out, let your belly spill out. So your ribs can drop down so we can calm your breathing pattern. And then quite a few people will feel their emotional state change with that. Because as your body learns how to release, you can also release emotions. Sometimes it means crying, shouting, whatever it is, but you release emotions and you shift. So when, when we look at people, there are patterns, but every person can go change their breathing pattern and go into a different state. 
and knowing knowing how you feel and having that self awareness in the moment to to kind of observe the the feeling that's kind of the the real key, isn't it? Because it, like you know, as I say it almost on every single mastering you podcast, it all, always comes back to self awareness, and it's always such a great reminder to myself as well. You know, just we, we have to sort of check in with ourselves sometimes. Yes, and so what what is your kind of recommendation with with breath work then i mean firstly you know if we look at like what what is a, a, a good breath work practice but how often should we practice something like breath work um you know particularly if we're going through times of anxiety or physical pain i'm guessing we we ramp it up a little bit more yeah so first i think is what are your intentions do you want to ramp yourself up or calm yourself down if you decide you want to calm yourself down, then you want to look at your body position. If you do, you can go find any breath work out there. You can go do box breathing. You can do Vucheco. You can do all these different kinds. But ultimately, if you want to make a change internally, then you have to look at your body position first and then start working on your breathing pattern. So I, I teach a very unique pattern of breathing and process. It is not something that you, it's once and done. Mm. I do like free guided breathing twice a week in a Facebook group. So I do that to help people kind of get started. Okay, great. Which, which is great and it's free for anyone. It's just, I have it as a private group so I don't get spammed. Yeah. But you can pick and choose. You can experiment with all the different types of breathwork practices out there and see if there's one that matches you. But keep in mind, if you just practice a pattern of breathing of like holding your breath for a count of eight, seven, or whatever it is, you're not fully changing your nervous system. You're practicing breath work, but to get the true nervous system change, you need to pair it with your body position so that you learn to calm the nervous system down and sense it happening. That's the key is what do you sense happening to your body? Okay. Any tips on the body position then? Because I think that would probably be an area that people sort of struggle with is, well, well, you know, trying to understand, okay, I get that, you know, we need to avoid that, the Donald Duck, you know, mm -hmm. sticking the bum out type, you know. Um, I mean, I, I, I remember getting some coaching myself, uh, you know, and just on, on my own training and the coach noticing my own rib cage was just opening up too much on my squat and, and then it was like, ah, oh, that makes complete sense. Why when I do back squats on those days, I tend to have a bit more back pain, you know, that, that, that load, that barbell is pushing down right on my spine. So for me, it's a constant practice to pull my hips underneath me a little bit, just to kind of flatten things out a little bit, you know, but, and that that's someone that's sort of been studying the human body for many years and kind of, you know, you know i consider myself as, as reasonably expertise but if you're someone listening and you're just trying to learn a bit more about why i've got back pain and, and you know how do i stand up right or how do i get my body in the right position when i'm sitting down at work are there any sort of general recommendations around around that like sitting and, yeah. and even standing yeah let's go through sitting i don't mess with people's standing position until they've mastered the sitting Okay. But if you start changing too many things at once, your body, again, the nervous system rebels. So if we look at sitting position, so first thing is sit all the way back into your chair and make sure you have a full chair back and the chair back, you want it to slightly lean backwards, not be completely vertical. I hate these dining room chairs where it's completely vertical. It is so bad for your body. So you want it silt tilted back just slightly. You want your low back to be all the way back. And then allow your tailbone to come forward slightly so it's like you're rounding out the low back buttocks area just a tiny bit. Right. I got you. And I'm also, doing it. I'm doing it as yeah. you speak. <laughs> good, good. And for most people, I'll tell them to take away that lumbar support. Get rid of that pillow that you're shoving back there oh. that's trying to shove your spine Get rid forward. Of that pillow. <laughs> it's gone. It's gone. Yes, yes. If you have a really extreme low back curvature you might still need the pillow there, but then work on decreasing it again, baby steps. Okay. I've got to interject you there. So mm -hmm. what is your opinion on these, um, 
what do we call them? I've got COVID brain at the moment, so I'm struggling with my words, but these chairs that are made for looking after our back, what do we call it? Orthopedic er chairs, er I think. Ergonomic. Er ergonomic, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yes. the, that's the word. A lot of them I actually don't recommend, especially yeah. these ones that are $1,000 or more. You're not, I'm, yeah. yeah. Kelly not Starrett working. is against these as well. I know that. Yeah. Yeah. So many of them, they have so many prominences and pillows and they're shoving your body into this position and it makes it so rigid for you it's gonna i just don't like it at all it's, yeah. it's scary to me what they do to the body so when you're sitting you want to sit let your back go all the way back into the chair back then have your feet flat on the ground when you're in this position you need to look at the height of your knees in relation to your hip crease mm. If your knees are below that hip crease, you need to lower the chair or stack a whole bunch of books under your feet or a platform to get your knees up so that it's the height of the hip crease. When I tell people this, most people are like, okay, I'm fine. And I'll look and I'm like, no, you're like two or three inches too low. And that makes all the difference, two or three it's inches. A huge difference. You want, if you put your hand on the top of your knee and then you find that hip crease right at the you know, the, where your thigh meets your trunk, your knee should be at least a little bit higher or at least even with, with that hip crease. Most people, their knees are a lot lower. They mm. look at the level of their thighs and they're like, okay, my thighs are level, but I want the tip of your knee to be at the level. And when you do that, all of a sudden you feel your low back relax. It brings you down a notch and you can feel your body start to relax because we want our body position to be in a state of fight or state of relaxation so that any mental, emotional, intellectual, spiritual stressors that come up in our day are not at that heightened state. If our body's ramped up, everything's going to be perceived as a greater stressor. If our body is calmed down, all those stressors that come don't seem as great of a danger. Well, that's, that's awesome. That's really, I think if, you, if you're listening, you probably want to, rewind that and listen and make a few notes on that because there's going to be so many people that will benefit from that i've got to ask as well one of the changes that i made my back problems really kicked off just before the pandemic um we opened a new studio lpt so like any business business owner that the workload cranks up and as a pt i spend much less time doing you know coaching and more time doing the business stuff on the computer and the laptop, more time sitting down. I got out of the habit of using my stand-up converter and I started sitting down more. And I definitely think that um, culminated in an increase in, in back issues. My, my glutes were dying. Um, but, I'm, but then I went back to standing and I equally had some issues. And then it wasn't until I realized that my standing posture wasn't great. And because of my standing posture not being good, and that was the standing up desk um, issues were, were just as bad. And so I think that's important to mention because a lot of people use the just stand up when you're working. At, you know, just that's the the, the solution all um, for this problem. What what your what's your opinion on working doing stand up work um, overall? I, I, think, I think it's great. Honestly, I think you should change positions every fifteen to twenty minutes. Yeah, stand up for yeah. fifteen minutes, sit down for fifteen minutes. Now with standing, one of the things you have to be careful is most of us are back dominant. When you reach, use your back. When you walk, use your back. When you run, use your back. When you lift up your leg, use your back. That's your prominent, your dominant mover. You're still using your arms and legs, but it's a whole process to go through. But most of us use our back more than anything. And so what happens is when you're standing for a long period of time and you're standing still, the back muscles kick in, your pelvis tips forward, back muscles kick in more you might lean to one side you might put an elbow down but the problem is because you are not used to using your thigh muscles to hold you up you can't sense them working and you can't sense your ability to turn your back off and your weight starts to get closer towards the front of your feet instead of back on the heels and that starts to exacerbate and that's when people start to have back pain is because they can't sense their thighs. So the back has to do the work. Right. So so you, you would recommend people experimenting with, with doing more stand-up work. I mean, I feel like we're just so in the dark ages still with how 
how we work and the fact that mm -hmm. for many, many, many people, I think potentially in America, you, you're a little further ahead of us, but you know, the idea of standing up and working just seemed because, because you sort of go to school and, and you're taught to sit down and it all starts there. It's such a foreign thing to do. Um, but I mean, I brought my first stand up converter probably about seven years ago when I sort of first really started to look into this stuff. And I must admit the first week or two, it was a, was really strange. <laughs> it took a <laughs> really strange thing to do. Have you, have you got any tips for people? Um, obviously you just mentioned about having intervals almost. So doing like 15 minutes of each. Um, have you got any tips around stand up work? So a couple things, this is a little bit hard and this is why I don't really teach it right away is because to get yourself in the correct position, it starts with your breastbone position. If your breastbone's prominent, you're going to use your back more. You're going to be forward more. But if I tell you right now, drop your breastbone in, most people are going to crunch. They're yeah. not going to actually melt their breastbone in to turn off their back. So that's I say that with caution because most people can't get that correctly. It takes a time and a process. So what I have to say about when you're standing is look at it from this perspective. If you're going to present and if you need to be on, standing is going to be good for that because standing is going to kick in your fight or flight nervous system. You need to be more animated. But when you need to focus and hold attention and calm down, sit down. So look at it is what is your purpose? Do you want to be ramped up? Then stand up. If you want to be calmer, sit down. And then from there, see if you can work towards calming yourself down when you're standing and feeling your thighs. Again, that's a process. And right. I don't want okay. people to go into the wrong position, yeah. but work with someone to help you feel your thighs muscles without using your back. And without using your calves, the more you can work on that, then you can start shifting your body. So your back doesn't do as much work standing. Nice. That's some great advice. Well, my, my last question, I guess, is, uh, is around surgery. So I mentioned my own back issues and not trying to make this all about me, by the way. Um, but I, I, I was literally, I think it was um, Christmas Eve and I was in so much pain. I was, I was on the floor in our living room, couldn't move. Um, I couldn't even get into an ambulance um, because I couldn't leave. So it was really bad. And the guy said to me, you're going to need surgery. You're going to need, you know, I've, I've had it. You're going to have to, you know, have your, some discs cut down or whatever. I don't know. I wasn't really listening too much at the time, but I kind of knew what the, what needed to be done. And, um, and, and, and I went away and I worked with my, my, my osteopath, a really good osteopath actually. And we sort of organically worked on the weak areas and um, worked on my body position. Quite honestly, everything that you've said hits has hit home massively about how right it was, what we did um, to get my body position right again. And but it just I can't help thinking about the thousands, potentially millions of people that that take that first bit of advice that I had from the paramedic that you're just going to have to go and get it you know some surgery so what what is your advice to people when they're in that position that you're in so much pain all you want to do is get rid of the pain um how do you make that choice that's a hard one because everyone's pain tolerance is different mm. so if you have the time to work on calming yourself down before anything i would really recommend that because when you're ready to go into surgery you need to have the perspective that the surgeon is going to cut things to create space. Your nervous system though, doesn't change just because you create space. Mm. It, it feels better because the pain is gone because you have this additional space, but the way that your muscles perform doesn't change because you still are programmed and have the habits from before. So when you're in that much pain, if you can work through it with someone, learning how to calm yourself down so that fight or flight nervous tension that's grasping on that area that's to protect you learns to let go 
so we can see how we can get your body back into position to free up the impingement that's contributing to the pain and contributing to the inflammation to allow you to possibly avoid surgery. And this goes for tears as well. I do this with people who have rotator cuff tears or disc herniations or ACL tears. They can get out of surgery as long as we can get their nervous system calmed down enough to get rid of that protective response that's keeping them in a bad position that's causing the pain. Wow. So it's a matter. Sometimes it might mean heating or icing. When it's okay to use all these modalities. Sometimes it means taking pain medications temporarily or an anti-inflammatory temporarily to give you that edge to calm you down enough that you can sense and feel your body let go. Now, obviously there are cases where you need to have emergency surgery and I totally yeah. understand that. But surgery for you is a real last resort. It really is because there's so much we can do beforehand. And again, it depends on the person. There are people that want the bandaid or the pill I completely understand and I'm completely supportive of it. If you want the surgery, I will support you in any way. But if you don't want the surgery, let's look at the other options and work towards healing you naturally. Fantastic. Well, I can't think of a, a better way to end. I really hope this message and, and this episode, you know, listen, if you're listening, please go over to um, Apple and, and rate it. I think this was a fantastic um, message and an episode. Share it to, to any friends that you've got that are in chronic pain, you know, potentially they're thinking, oh, maybe I need to go down the surgery route. Maybe they need to listen to this first mate, and they need to get in contact with Amy. Um, Amy's working with people all around the world right now. Like you know, we spoke just before we started, you know, 99% of your clients are, are you're helping them virtually. So it can be done. You know, that's the benefit of living in 2022. This thing can be done. Um, so what we'll do, we'll, we'll put those links to find out more about you in the, the show notes, Amy, but is there anywhere particularly that people can go to, to learn more about what we discussed? Obviously there's only so much, such a complex thing, right? So there's only so much we can com- sort of talk about in 40 minutes, but where can people go to find out more? Yeah, they can go to my website, paberinstitute.com, P-A-B-R institute.com. That stands for pain, awareness, breathing, relief. Um, a lot of resources there, interviews, um, ways to get a hold of me. I do free 15 minute consultations, so we can set all that up. But, but if you just go there, that's brilliant. Oh, any final words, Amy? Sure. To say, as you go out, go throughout your day, think ribs down, belly out. Try not to suck up your gut. Try not to hold your breath. Let yourself go. It can change your life in just seconds ribs down belly up like it thanks amy